immersive uh, sound system design. Uh, we are uh, Natalia and Jack. Uh, I'm um, an immersive and experiential segment manager at Holoplot. And I'm, I'm Jack Human. I'm a project engineer here at Holoplot looking after system design. Great, thanks, Jack. So today we'll be uh, looking at a few different uh, topics. Uh, we will definitely start with introducing you a little bit to what the Holoplot toolbox is. What does the system do? What can it, uh, what can it provide? What are the capabilities? So we'll start with that. Uh, we'll look at different approaches to uh, immersive system design. Uh, there are a few different options there. Uh, so we'd like to discuss that with you. Uh, then we'll actually zoom into one of those approaches to um, basically take a look at how the kind of more unusual way to introduce uh, immersive sound into your uh, venue is. And we'll, at the back of that, take a look at the, the real life example of Lightroom, a project which opened uh, recently in London. Um, and while doing all of this, Jack will be uh, here also to, uh, to introduce you to how to design all these different immersive experiences in our uh, software Holoplot uh, plan. So let's dive right in. Um, maybe to start with, what would be useful is to kind of uh, orientate ourselves. How do we get here, actually? And how did we get to immersive audio in the first place? So, Traditionally, of course, the stories that we've been uh, told, they were actually told verbally usually, or their life started on paper. Uh, it was really up to our imagination to bring these stories to life. Uh, then plays and, and movie theaters uh, showed up, and that's where um, a kind of a fixed uh, visual point, a stage was introduced. Uh, so we kind of have a situation where we have a fixed stage, fixed audience members' uh, locations, and really, the experience is actually pretty much uh, fixed as a result of that. Um, designing for that is, uh, one could argue, a little bit easier than what we're working uh, with these days. Uh, we'll get to that. So, so really, we have emerging new formats, such as um, uh, surround sound, where really kind of like an evolution uh, on uh, against still a fixed audience positions, right? So, so we have this kind of sweet spot and the audience is surrounded with uh, sound. Then the, obviously the content creation had to follow uh, that um, new, those new emerging uh, formats. Where are we kind of now or where are we heading towards? I think uh, everyone has seen in one shape or, or another um, what these new um, um, entertainment formats introducing these days. So we are uh, looking at a very rapidly changing landscape, really. Uh, it's presenting new opportunities to, to tell the story. So instead of going to a museum and, and interacting with one piece at the time and maybe reading a short description, the, the piece is kind of all around you and the story is being told to you at the same time of how the, uh, the process of producing it of, uh, of that piece um, uh, evolved. Um, we call this perhaps an experiential entertainment or immersive experiences. That's kind of really uh, a few of these terms that we're using. Now, importantly, audience is really free to move around and explore. Uh, the story, the, the media, the technology is all around you. Uh, traditionally still, so that's a pre holoplot times tradition, that, that still means that the technology is visible around me. Do I want to see the technology? Let's come back to that also. Um, sound design for these type of experiences, of course, is a lot more complex, um, maybe more challenging, um, but definitely a lot more rich and, and a lot more exciting for uh, the visitors. So. Now, not only the storytelling uh, has changed, but also the spaces in which we experience uh, these stories. So often these days we are working with repurposed um, um, spaces, repurposed venues. We no longer have a perfectly designed acoustic um, environment to work with. Um, obviously, surround, actually any sound system, but the surround sound system in particular perhaps is is um, re requires a slightly more, if not a lot more, controlled acoustic environment. Um, so we have we have that. We have the repurposed difficult spaces. Uh, we have interactivity, perhaps um, the the kind of static traditional setup no longer really works so well in these spaces. So we we're looking at challenging acoustic environments. 
Um, we're looking at, again, new content approaches, mixing techniques. Um, the, the spaces we're working uh, with are typically multi-purpose venues. Um, again, typically, if it's a surround system, you will see it because it has to uh, perform uh, to, uh, to a certain level. That's why it's very difficult to hide it. This is something that we at Holoplot actually work quite a lot with hiding the technology and, and um, allowing you to immerse yourself in the content itself. Um, so what happens when we're actually working with um, a repurposed space? And it could be very, very, uh, how to say, maybe architecturally boring, uh, minimal uh, space. So this is what, uh, what leads us a little bit to uh, introducing you to, to what Lightroom uh, project is about. This picture, believe it or not, is actually, uh, obviously it's a still construction site. Uh, during the construction site, you can actually see, if you look closely to the back of the room, there is a little cutout, it's not so little, but it's little in the picture. It's a cutout of where uh, uh, we have one of our arrays. There are only two arrays in that space. Um, and believe it or not, that's, that picture was taken not very long uh, before the space opened to the public. So how do we get from this crazy reverberant concrete box to uh, something that immerses people with content, with beautiful art and uh, beautiful um, uh, sound uh, that's immersive. Um, so kind of we, we looked a little bit at, at the, the changing landscape, what that means uh, for designs and the, the mixing approaches. Um, important, I think, to, to note here is that the speaker technology hasn't really changed for a very long time. And this is where uh, we believe uh, that at Holoplot that we are able to bring something new. Uh, we're, we're bringing a new toolbox. We're bringing new capabilities. And really, it's all about control. And here, I mean both the control of, of the room acoustics. So essentially, we want to control the, the behavior of the room. And we also obviously want to control the, the behavior of the sound system. So the combination of the two will be um, crucial in our immersive audio uh, reproduction. So to talk a little bit about uh, Holoplot and what we do and, and how uh, what we're kind of um, offering here. Uh, there are a few concepts to introduce here, um, probably some new terms, so please don't be too worried about that just yet. We will go into, um, into them um, during this session. I think the most important two things to kind of note here is the, the 3D audio beamforming, which we separate from um, wave field synthesis. The 3D audio beamforming um, is what, in my head, I separate this a little bit in the sense that these are the more functional, useful beams, which will allow us to provide the coverage and control the, control the room acoustics to some extent. Then wave field synthesis comes in to bring all the extras, all the nice immersive tricks and, and we'll go into all of this in a second. Um, so basically um, important to maybe start with our hardware. Uh, we introduced uh, a, a new type of sound system, the matrix array. Uh, this is the X1 uh, matrix array officially launched in uh, 2021. Uh, we built from two uh, modules, module types, we build arrays depending on the, the requirement of the project. We have module 96, which is a two-way matrix array, and module 80S, a three-way uh, matrix array. The numbers correspond to the numbers of drivers. And the reason I like to show this to you now is because it's important to understand that each of these uh, drivers is actually individually uh, controlled, individually um, in terms of both level and delay. And it's really that level of control within each module and within each array. This is what allows us to control the overall um, sound dispersion coming out of our array. So here, the capabilities of uh, the system, which we'll discuss in a moment, really come as a consequence of this, um, this completely new approach to sound reproduction, um, both in terms of the hardware and, of course, in terms of the software. Um, the combination of the two, of course, allows, uh, allows us to, to really start playing with sound in completely new ways, uh, in ways which we probably 
uh, phytosane not used to yet. Hopefully, we will be. Um, so, Plan is our uh, design software. Uh, this is where we um, where we kind of we in a three D model we set up our arrays. We tell the software uh, how to cover uh, specific audience areas in and so on. Uh, Jack later on will be helping us um, understand how we navigate plan and and how to use it. So now back to uh, immersive system design or surround system design. Perhaps this is a good time to maybe pause for a moment and understand or question what do we understand under uh, surround, under immersive, under spatial sound. I think traditionally we would probably think of um, of a system design that's distributed. So we have speakers uh, positioned around the audience. And um, I would probably claim that this would be a, a traditionally speaking, a surround system. Um, and um, towards uh, the end of, um, or maybe during the course of, of our session today, we will maybe uh, see if there is a way to distinguish between the two, whether our sound system is just a surround system and or if it's a surround system and an immersive system. And I'll, I'll come to that in a moment. So um, the first type, let's say, of, of, of these systems would be the distributed system. And this can uh, range from a very small installation, such as uh, this one. This is actually uh, uh, one of our installations here in Berlin. It's called Dark Matter. If you guys are ever here, I highly recommend uh, to go and experience this. Uh, it can. Uh, obviously go up to uh, very large scale immersive uh, systems. You may have heard, you may have uh, seen some uh, media lately about MSG Sphere. We will not have enough time to go uh, into a lot of detail about that particular project. It opens in September. Um, we, there are some details actually on our website, so please uh, check them out. And there will be future webinars uh, on that specifically. So, so please keep an eye on that. Uh, but for now, just important to understand we have the scale is from very small immersive system setups to large ones where we, in, in the case of uh, MSG Sphere, we, we immerse 20,000 people uh, in sound uh, and provide them very unique experiences there. So that's the, the, the kind of uh, key message here. Um, I think it's worth um, maybe keeping this image in mind because I'd like to come back to this. Once we've covered a little bit more about the capabilities of holoplot systems, I will explain why uh, and how these capabilities apply very importantly into the design of a, of a uh, immersive and kind of surround, let's say traditionally speaking, uh, system. Perhaps what we wouldn't intuitively think about when we think of immersive, or surround system design is, um, is a centralized system like the one you, you're looking at right now. So here, essentially, there is a cluster of loudspeakers positioned in one location in the room. And um, yeah, per perhaps it's, it's not intuitive. Uh, how could something like this provide me with an immersive experience, audio experience in the space? Um, we will show you how uh, we utilize all our technology capabilities to actually do that. Um, this is maybe a good moment for me to hand over to Jack for him to, um, to walk us through a little bit of, of the introduction to the Lightroom uh, project. Yeah, hi, everyone. So for anyone who hasn't experienced Lightroom yet, you can see in this image here that it's a 360 projection, including the floor, um, that currently with the show tells the story of uh, David Hockney and his artwork. Um, and this, we worked very closely with uh, 59 Productions and Gareth Fry, this sound designer here, to, to overcome a few issues to, to really achieve this, this immersive audio in a very challenging acoustic space. If we look at the dimensions of the space, here we can see that we've got an 18 meter by 26 meter concrete, essentially concrete box, which is 15 meters tall. And anyone here that understands that will, will know instantly this is, this is a very challenging acoustic space. And the key aspects here were to maintain speech clarity and, and the clarity of music. And we're going into a little bit more detail about how, how we worked very closely with, uh, with Gareth Fry and 59 Productions to achieve that. Um, but one of the challenges we had to overcome was, was the array placement as well. So we were only able to position arrays in either end of the room, as you can see in the image here. And we still needed from these positions to achieve 360 immersive audio. 
and achieve localization from positions where there was no audio source placed. So here we, we utilized two arrays, both of these being two by four arrays. So that's two high and four wide. And both uh, contained four MD80S with the IPAL subwoofer in the rear and four MD96 across the top there. Um, so yeah, that, that, there's some of the challenges we, we had to overcome to, to really get um, some of the challenges we had to overcome within the, within the space. And we go into a little bit more detail later about, about how, we, how we use certain beam types to achieve those. Cool, thank you, Jack. So let's actually take a look at uh, some of these first capabilities. So uh, let's remember again, we, we split the capabilities of Holoplot into first this 3D audio beam forming, which I, in my own head, I think of them as more uh, functional beams and then uh, the, the wave field synthesis uh, one. So here, let's start with the uh, coverage beams with the uh, 3D uh, audio beam forming. Um, What's important to, to understand here is that the way this works is a little bit like you would uh, work with, with light illuminating certain areas, but not necessarily illuminating others. So we design a, um, a coverage beam depending on where our audience area is. And what's beautiful about this is that you can actually, um, you can really expect a really homogeneous cover, which means that whether I'm sitting right in the front or at the very back, the level and the spectral uniformity is, is as good, right? So, so each seat is really uh, equal to, to an, one another. Then um, as a result of focusing the acoustic energy on specific area, we are able to really um, preserve this energy, meaning that the acoustic energy doesn't get dispersed everywhere in an uncontrolled way, but really is controlled to that specific zone. Preserving this energy means that and this is a very important point, is that over distance, we really lose very little SPL. So it's a very consistent level over distance. Um, now, you design your audience area. This could be a square like here. It could be a triangle. It can really, uh, um, you, you can go creative with this. Uh, one other element here is that uh, we control, obviously, independently in horizontal and vertical dimensions. So it's a, it's a very flexible and a very precise way to to steer sound and cover uh, audiences. You can have more than one uh, coverage zones coming out of the speaker, and you can have them actually happening simultaneously. Here we're showing two. In fact, every holoplot uh, matrix array is capable of generating four coverage beams. And each of these coverage beams, coverage zones, has its own or can have its own uh, content level EQ, so they're very independent of one another and they can play simultaneously. So in terms of your experience, you really can be in one room and walk along the room and really walk in and out of specific uh, um, sound zones, which is a really nice effect, a very useful effect. This is something actually, so the coverage beams is something that we, we used obviously in uh, Lightroom, so maybe I'll hand over back to Jack to tell us how, how that's been used. Yeah, so, so within Lightroom, we knew early on that it was key, as I mentioned, to maintain speech intelligibility and the clarity of music. Um, part of the sh a lot of the show is, is David Hockney talking through his processes behind his artwork. And as mentioned, this is a challenging acoustic space. So we really needed to tame that energy and keep it where, where it was needed and, and mitigate any unwanted reflections or unnecessarily exciting the space that would would uh, diminish that speech intelligibility and, and the clarity of, of that lovely score behind all of this. So we created these, these coverage zones from the arrays that cover the floor area as, uh, so we can really, really contain that energy and maintain that speech intelligibility. And what I'll do now is I'll, I'll jump over into Holoplot Plan, which I have here in front of me, and we'll sort of, we have a quick look around how we use Holoplot Plan to create these coverage areas. So here I have an example space not too dissimilar from Lightroom in London. And first I'll introduce the two different zone types we have. You'll see here we have the gray surfaces. These are what we call boundary zones. And these are anything that's not acoustically transparent, such as walls or architectural features that need to be considered in your model. And then on top of that, we also have our audience areas. And these are shown in the green. And you'll see here that I've actually divided this audience area into six sections. And this will become a bit more apparent as, as I move through these different coverage beams. Um, so first we're gonna look at 
a beam where we're just covering all six of these segments in the audience area. And down here, you'll see that all I need to do is click which audience areas I want to consider. So here we have all of the, the six planes, the audience planes in this consideration, but we are also actively avoiding with the 3D beam forming the two long side walls to help us really maintain that clarity, that speech intelligibility was key to this project. So once we've got that, it's as simple as clicking optimize and allowing that to, that to run through and all our algorithms do the hard work for you. But once we've got that, we're able to use our simulate tab here to really visualize and look at how, how the system's performing within that space. So here we are looking at those, those two arrays, both optimized for all the areas. And we can really see how we're keeping that energy within the audience area that we need it and keeping the energy as much as possible off those sidewalls to really, really maintain that clarity and intelligibility. But furthermore from that, we can do some more interesting things with these coverage beams. So I mentioned that I segmented these down into six different areas. If we jump back into our configure tab where we define those, we can look at this, this beam here I've got, which is bar exclusion. So in this example, let's say we have a bar area over these two, surf, uh, these two squares here, and we want to keep the energy away from that. So it's a little bit more of a quieter space. So we can actively avoid those again by clicking from our zones panel down the side here, setting whether we want to cover or avoid, and we're maintaining that avoidance on the east and west walls. And you'll see that we are also avoiding these two areas and that allows us to create that separation. So if we jump back into our simulate tab and have a look at those. So if I turn those ones off and keep our bar exclusion, you can really see how we've got that, that vertical control in the arrays to keep the energy where we've asked the optimization algorithm to put it and avoid sending it to where it's not necessary or not wanted within the space. And this, this is showing our vertical control, but we have 3D audio beamforming. So let's also have a look at how we can use our horizontal control here as well. So in this example, we're going to look at splitting the room into two. So let's have a look at one side first within our simulate tab. And here we can really, really see how we're keeping the energy on one side of the room and avoiding the other side of the room. And again, I'll jump back over here and switch those so we can see how we're doing the same on the other side. And it's very key, it's key to remember that each one of these optimized coverage beams is a set, can be a separate Dante or Ravenna output channel. So each can have its own unique content and they can all be outputting at the same time. In this example, we have four and we can have up to four per array of these optimized coverage beams. So an example for that, maybe you use your all areas beam to, to have like a bed of audio. There's a musical score playing. And then on top of that, we've got just using the two halves of the space have different experiences. So, so one half of the space, we've got more winter sounds and one half of the space, we've got more summer sounds, whatever, whichever sort of matches your visual content. For example, if this is a 360 projection space or something like that. Cool, thank you, Jack. So wrapping up maybe the coverage beams, I see some questions um, which I can actually answer already uh, with regards to the bandwidth. So what I'm showing right now is an example of a two kilohertz octave band. What Jack was showing was, uh, was um, SPO mappings broadband DBA. So it is, it is a broadband um, a signal he was showing. Here, here this is a simplified, obviously, uh, version. Um, what, again, to kind of quickly wrap up what these things are, I call them functional, but I think Jack also gave you a few examples of how to use these type of beams in a creative way. So, so it's maybe always a little bit of a, uh, of a uh, difficult to really just uh, call, uh, classify these beams, right? It, but in that sense, let's consider them from, from that perspective that they provide the main coverage. This is what we typically used to with, with traditional system designs. It's all about coverage level uniformity. So we have amazing coverage. We have uniform coverage. We have little drop of level over distance. Um, we focus the energy on the audience and really minimize the amount of um, acoustic energy into the, um, you know, the ac acoustic, um, sorry, into the walls and ceilings, right? So into the, the uh, room itself. And all of these um, capabilities will be very important when we come back to thinking about 
surround and a distributed system in a bit. So that was coverage beams. That's, that was the 3D audio beam forming. Now let's take a quick look at uh, the um, wave field synthesis capability. So this is a spatial audio reproduction uh, technology, which is not unique to Holoplot, and it's not something we invented, but we make use of that also. So we're um, working with the concept of uh, virtual uh, sources. So as you can see on this image, the virtual source is a point to which the wave front will converge in space. So it really converges into a single point and it kind of opens up afterwards, but there is a point of convergence. And this point we can position in front of the array as I'm uh, showing right now. Uh, in fact, you can have up to eight of these points on top of the four coverage beams, which we discussed earlier. So each array is capable of producing 12 beams in total. Each of these beams can have an individual content um, uh, within that. So these uh, targeted experiences, um, you can imagine that as an audience member, you are the only person hearing a specific thing in the space. And your uh, friend who's with you in a space is hearing something different. For instance, it could be actually a, a multiple translation of, of something that's happening. And you really can kind of step into your individual zone. Or it could be a sound effect or, or anything really that you, uh, you feel like uh, placing in there. So this is when that virtual source is positioned within the audience area. We can, of course, also position it behind the array. Now, imagine the array is a little bit of our window through which we're looking at an audio scene. So wherever I place this audio virtual source um, behind the array, everyone within the audience will be pointing in the same direction. So it really is all about the perfect localization of the source. And now let's think about what would happen if we positioned that uh, virtual source within our space, but directed at a reflective surface. So in this case, um, we're shooting a beam towards a wall. The, the uh, virtual source is positioned very close to the wall or at the wall. It bounces off the wall and arrives in the audience uh, area, giving people the impression that there is a source coming from the wall without necessarily needing a loudspeaker uh, there. This is something, again, we utilized within uh, a Lightroom. So I'll hand over to Jack to tell us more about that. Yeah, so as mentioned, we, was only able to, we were only able to position arrays in these either, end, either ends of the room. But it was also key to have sound localized from these, these large projection surfaces at certain points during the show. So the way we did that was utilizing our wave field synthesis capabilities and using these reflections. So here in the image, you can see, see how that reflection works. And this, this shows one reflection. But within Lightroom, we've actually used six reflections distributed along each of those side long walls. And this allows for the angle of instance so that no matter where you are within the space, you're always within one of those reflections and localizing to those walls. So if we jump back over to, to Holoplot Plan now, I'll show you how, how we utilize those within Plan. So that's, let's start with a wall reflection here. So you'll see now I've brought up this reflection and we have this sort of wireframe outline of the beam so we can visualize what this beam's doing within the model. And it's as simple as selecting that I want a virtual source in front of the array, the audio channel that this will be outputting, and then placing the parameters of where you want that within 3D space. And that is where the energy will focus on. And that's where your virtual source will be positioned. So if we zoom in, you can, you can visualize that here as the energy diverges onto a point and then converges away from that. And this is as if you've got a point source which is facing that wall. And then that energy hits the wall and due to the angle of instance reflects back into the space. Within Holoplot Plan, we are always looking at direct SBL. So we can't visualize how that reflection is happening, um, but we'll come back to that in a second of how we, we can utilize other tools to, to show that. So if we jump over into our simulate tab here, we can see how each of those reflections. So here we have four. So we have two from each of the arrays that you can see as I'm, as I'm toggling through here. And if we jump over again into our simulate tab, you can see how that energy is hitting that reflective surface. And it's key that this can be any reflective surfaces. Within Lightroom, this is just a concrete projection surface, but you could also hang and manipulate the shapes of reflectors and things like that to really, really experiment how, how they work. And 
a key point. We spent a lot of time in the venue, um, along with Gareth Fry and, and other members of my team. And we were looking at sort of the ideal focal point away from um, the ideal focal point away from the reflective surface to really open up that sweet spot and make sure everyone within the space got that, that reflection and was able to localize to where that reflection was coming from. But beyond this, we can actually bring these, as, as Natalia stated, into the space as well to create these really unique experiences. So for this example here, we have four what we like to call floor focus points. And these, we've put the position of the virtual source at head height so that when people move around the space, suddenly they'll walk into this of what we like to call Easter egg and allow people to discover these, these almost unique experiences as you move through the space. So here we've got four of them, two of them from each array. And if we jump back over into our simulate tab, again, we're looking at the direct SPL here and we can mute these and turn these on. Here we can see how they're, how they're behaving within the space. And you can see that as you're gonna move into this space, you'll get this, this real unique experience that can, each of these with a different sound effect, all coming from the same array. So like, as I mentioned, these, these are sometimes referred to as Easter eggs within the space that people, people discover. discover. And it, it allows for sort of the repeat, repeatability to come back to, into a venue so that you, no experience to each time is going to be the same. But there's another trick that we can use these for as well. And that's to create a sense of proximity within the space. And if you've ever come to one of our, one of our demos, you would have experienced this with a whisper at the end of the room. And it's really real sense that there's a whisper coming from right in front of you. So for this, this example venue, what we've done is we've positioned a virtual source just in front of where guests would enter the space. And this could be potentially a dialogue that's explaining uh, what's about, what you're about to experience or something like that. And it, it's, it's, a, it's, quite a, it's quite a strange experience when you first hear it and you get this, this real sense of proximity as you're looking into an empty void and there's like someone whispering as if they're right in front of you or something like that. And hopefully a few of you have come along to, to our demonstrations and, and experienced that, but we can also pop back into our simulate tab. And if I unmute that, you can really see how we're creating that, that tight, unique experience that's just covering this entrance as people move into the space. So that's, that's how we can utilize the, the wavefield synthesis capabilities of X1. But I mentioned about the reflections and how do we validate those considering we're just looking at the direct SBL and before we get into space, how do we know how they're gonna perform? Well, with, with Holoplot Plan, we're able to export each one of our beams for the arrays as ease configuration files. So we can take those into closed room modeling and really understand how these reflections are going to perform. And this is an, this is an example here from a study I actually completed for uh, Lightroom to really understand. And here we're looking at the total SPL within the space from an ease model to really understand. And you can see how that reflection is coming back into the space. So we're able to validate those using closed room modeling. And this is really great for, uh, thanks for that, Jack. Great for, for the acousticians in the room who are interested in maybe considering different, uh, different reflective surfaces. And again, I think it's a nice way to start thinking about uh, the room finishes kind of working with you rather than having to work against them. I think uh, I'm an ex-acoustic consultant myself and I know the pains of trying to convince the architects to uh, introduce acoustic absorption into a space. So uh, I think it's a, it's a really nice way to kind of verify this and, and you can really start designing these beams uh, uh, from, from your desk and without having to necessarily be in the space. And, and I think someone asked about uh, maybe curved uh, reflectors and so on. That's exactly something you could test in uh, uh, through this, uh, this method. Good, so we, we kind of looked at these uh, this decentralized uh, smaller uh, arrays which are capable of uh, generating the immersion, the sense of immersion and, the, and really surrounding people in uh, audio even though there might not be speakers all around you. So th there is, it really opens up possibilities in spaces like Lightroom where the sound designer actually was was only given two locations. That, uh, Gareth Fry was was told these are the only positions we can offer you, but we'd still like to have an immersive uh, experience, uh, immersive audio in the space. Is that possible? So now we know that is actually uh, something that, with our capabilities, you can you can um, provide. 
into your uh, venue. Now, the kind of just going back to what we looked at before, so we looked at these 3D audio beamforming um, capabilities, the uh, coverage beams, uh, which you can have up to four of. We looked at the wave field synthesis part, uh, where you can have up to eight of the, those very targeted uh, beams, which are a lot more about the localization as well. And really, again, the combination of the two of these um, um, technologies is what allows us to really start to deliver uh, an outstanding immersive uh, audio experience. Um, now, let's go back to this original image, which we uh, just took a look at before. It's uh, it's a very complex, of course, uh, surround and immersive design. I think what's important here to now bring back this, this kind of knowledge, which we just uh, gained about coverage beams, about um, uh, focus beams, uh, targeted individual experiences, and understand, um, you can really start understanding how this, how useful this is here. So we can now start thinking about no longer requiring our uh, environment to be extremely controlled. So this is traditionally a quite an important requirement in order to have a good, clear uh, surround sound. You either need a lot of uh, uh, points, uh, point sources, or you need a very highly um, uh, controlled environment. Now, with our technology, because of the, the amount of control we have over the sound beams, we can really uh, imagine in a situation like this, where we're in a venue, we're standing directly next to one of the arrays, we hear the sound coming out of that array. If that was a traditional point source, the precedence effect would probably take place, meaning that that very point source would dominate our environment. So this is probably the only one, or mostly the one uh, source we would hear. We wouldn't hear much else. With our technology and with the, the beamforming, we are able to introduce a, um, a situation where actually you're standing right next to one of these arrays, but you can hear still very clearly what happens, what's happening around you uh, and what's coming out of uh, the other arrays. So that's a very, very important point to think about. So it's kind of, in a way, we are let's say, um, controlling the, the room acoustics in a way. We're really cleaning up the room acoustics to lay the foundation for our mix. And then we can start introducing all these different effects on top of this. So they are very nicely uh, uh, and clear, um, clearly uh, positioned um, sound sources. Um, so again, just bringing this back very quickly, just to talk a little bit again about how from a smaller array, you're capable of introducing a uh, immersive system. So Lightroom is an example where with two positions of um, um, loudspeaker arrays, we are able to not just surround people with sound, not only provide them with a nice bed of music, uh, and not only provide them with very cleanly intelligible uh, speech, which is extremely important in that specific venue. Um, mind you, the reverberation time in that space on an average is, I think, uh, six seconds. So perhaps normally it would be difficult to even imagine a clearly intelligible speech in a room like this coming from an, uh, from an amplified um, source. And this, all of this comes together. And then on top of this, you have all these different uh, uh, Easter eggs we discussed. So to quickly wrap up, we looked at the, the different ways that you can design uh, an immersive system, um, what this means, what the immersive surround distinction might be. Uh, and then, again, the, the immersive system is traditionally requiring a controlled acoustic environment. Now we're working with more difficult spaces with usually concrete boxes with very minimal um, architecturally uh, spaces. and we're able to actually still introduce a nice, clean, immersive uh, system, immersive mix into these spaces. So it really opens up a lot of possibilities in terms of where and what type of spaces you can have this experience. Then the main functions of the uh, holoplot systems, obviously, again, is the coverage, that focused, um, that level of control, being able to target specific areas, having sound zones, uh, and I think what's really, really nice, and I really like that, is that you can have within a very large shared experience, you can have your own individual experience or, a, a, or one which is, let's say, designed for a small group of people. And even within that group, a single person can receive something else. So they can hear a mosquito flying around them. 
whereas no one else will hear it. So it's a very uh, nice way to really bring us back to kind of how we experience nature in a sense that those experiences are very, of course, immersive. Nature is immersive. And we can now start thinking about reproducing, being really able to reproduce these natural environments uh, and more uh, with technology. Um, we are actually, I think what we maybe didn't touch on uh, um, enough yet is, is actually hiding the system. So I think there was one question about this also in terms of um, can we shoot sound through something, through um, you know, a, a, a material that conceals it. In fact, majority of our uh, projects with, which we've deployed so far have uh, in one way or another uh, a material in front of them uh, which hide them. So, so there are ways, and in fact, again, Holoplot um, speakers are intelligent enough that they can introduce a, a correction factor that is dependent a little bit on a beam as well. So you can very cleverly uh, compensate for whatever you're introducing in there, resulting in a very nice and clear uh, sound. Pretty much whatever came in originally comes out on the other end, thanks to those correction um, filters. So again, with all of these capabilities, we end up with clear, intelligible layers of sound uh, that do not fight for bandwidth. So we have this nice foundation, this nice groundwork, which are our coverage beams controlled, uh, not exciting the room and unnecessarily. And then on top of this, we start layering all these different experiences. And this is what we would call a truly immersive sound, uh, sound design. Um, now I will leave this on uh, the page. So we've, we've reached the end of the, this, this part of the, uh, the conversation, let's say, and uh, here is a QR code. Feel free to, to scan it. Uh, this will allow you access to our uh, Holoplot plan software so you can really have a go at this yourself. Uh, I think it's really something that, that is, um, is very easy and it's very uh, fun also. So you can really test all your, all your ideas and understand um, how these things work. Um, we have our contact details here. And I think we have some more questions that maybe we can, um, we can answer still. We should have time. Cool. So uh, let me read this. Uh, was the uh, content design done in advance or did it have to be done after the installation? So actually, um, thanks to the planning uh, software that we have, you can actually prepare a lot of it before you actually get to site. So, so there is, to some extent, for instance, when you're working with wall reflections, um, well, actually, walls are easy. Well, you some, we sometimes introduce reflectors, so we bring an additional material that requires, uh, you know, we bounce the sound off that. That requires a bit of tweaking on site. Everything else can be really um, prepared ahead of time uh, to, to, a, to a high extent. So how, how responsive the system to rapid changes in zone control parameters? So. If, if, if this, this question is relating sort of like um, if we're changing areas and things like that, then, then this can be as simple as changing the output channel. Um, so if you've got one zone that's on, on Dante output one and another that's on output two, but also we can have, we can have different presets ready for a show and they're, they're very quick within a, within a second or so. They're, they're back up onto the system as long as everything's optimized and ready to go before. Cool. Uh, pattern controls gets more difficult with lower frequency content. Is there ideal frequency? Yeah, I think it's it's a very good question. Of course, I think what Jack also mentioned earlier, uh, there is a limit. Of course, in terms of the the frequency, the low and um, in fact, the the larger your array, the lower the frequency uh, you can control. Um, but with, with, when it comes to the sub base frequencies, we, we wouldn't claim we can steer them and, and be very precise with them. So, so there, is a, um, there is a range of frequencies which you can steer, which you can, um, you can kind of realistically expect to be uh, clearly uh, separated. Um, again, it's a, it's a question of uh, the size of your array and both in the horizontal and in, sorry, in the horizontal and in the vertical dimension. So again, the wider your array, the more, uh, the control you have in the horizontal, the taller your array, the more you have uh, in the vertical. I suppose, I suppose this is a good one for you, Nat, with the yes, distribution. Uh, 
Yeah, there. Thanks for that question. So, in which venues around the world did you implement a distributed system? Um, so, I mentioned already the the the, the small, let's say, uh, immersive system here, distributed system we have here in Berlin, uh, Dark Matter. Uh, it's a space which is I can't remember the dimensions actually, but probably something like maybe six meters by six meters by six. It's kind of like a cube. It's very minimal. It's Berlin. It's 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 just a black painted concrete. Uh, so it's a, again a very reverberant room. Um, and here it's a yeah super nice way to kind of uh, experience what I mentioned earlier, where you can stand right next to one speaker and hear perfectly what's happening in the rest of the mix. The mix was done by uh, Robert Henke, which some of you might know. Um, uh, and yeah, it's, it's, that's a kind of smallest uh, version, let's say. We also have a few distributed systems over in the US, uh, in Atlanta. It's a, a Illuminarium, one of well, the first Illuminarium project we um, installed. And there's another Illuminarium project in uh, Las Vegas. I hope I'm not forgetting anything. Um, obviously, the big one, uh, MSG Sphere opening in September. I think there's a lot of information online. I don't want to go into this too much right now, but that's going to be the, the largest uh, distributed uh, system on the planet, I think. <laughs> so yeah, that's the range. Are there any more questions? I think, I don't know if we have enough time left. So I think if I'm... Uh, Yes, I think we're closing. Good. Um, thank you all so much for your time and your questions. We really appreciate it. It's been a pleasure to, to be able to uh, talk to you a little bit about uh, what we do, how we do things. We obviously, here you have your um, contact details. Feel free to get in touch to, to ask any other questions you might have. Uh, it's, it's amazing to see so many comments. Thank you so much. And I'm really sorry we couldn't answer all of them. Uh, but please, yeah, scan the code uh, and and access Holoplot plan and yeah, let us know how you're getting on with it, and uh, hopefully see you next time in the next webinars. Yeah. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye bye.